everyone, and welcome to SciComm Monday. I'm your host, Nicole Wood. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a lot of fun with some ornithology and birds. But for those of you who are new to the broadcast and you haven't watched SciComm Monday before, we encourage you to be actively engaged with the broadcast. So please use the integrated chat module uh, that is on uh, Periscope here. Send in your questions. We'll do our best to uh, answer them. If we don't answer them during the broadcast, definitely feel free uh, to tweet us. Um, or say if you're actually watching this on replay, definitely then tweet us any of your questions. Uh, you can reach me at uh, either the broadcast Twitter of at Monday or at my personal handle of Wildlife Bio Gal. Uh, today's guest is um, Heidi Trudell, and you could reach her at Just Save Birds on Twitter. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome her uh, to the broadcast today. Thanks for being here, Heidi. Thanks, Nicole. It's good to be here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and what's the big issue with bird strikes on windows. <laughs> so hi, uh, my name is Heidi Trudell and I pick up dead birds. Um, what I do basically is find buildings that have large shiny windows because those are most likely to have dead birds and I tend to monitor them. Um, I mean, we all need hobbies. Uh, some of us have slightly stranger hobbies than others, but um, by routinely monitoring buildings. Um, you can get a nice set of data that you can either propose modifications be made to the windows or you can take that back to architects and say, hey, your designs are actually hurting birds a lot. Um, can you please not design things this way anymore? Um, the, the bright side, it's never really a bright side, but um, basically every dead bird is a learning opportunity and every dead bird that I pick up at least uh, goes to the University of Michigan and historically they've gone to other scientific collections as well. Great. So um, what are some of the, the big things with bird strikes? I always normally think of bird strikes as something that happens on these big, huge buildings and these big old cities. Is it a major problem there or does it happen everywhere? So oddly enough, um, every freestanding residence will kill between two and 10 birds a year on average. And the average skyscraper only kills about 30. So yeah, and houses without feeders obviously won't kill as many as those that do have feeders. Um, so if people have feeders, that number could be almost tied with skyscrapers. Of course, this depends on location. Um, but yeah, residents are responsible for approximately half of the window kills in North America. And this is a terrible sounding number, but about a billion birds every year die from hitting windows. Um, that estimate is as low as like 380 something that, um, million, but um, 998 million was the, the last number that was accurately thrown around a couple of years ago. So it's a huge problem and every little bit counts, especially if a window has had repeat collisions that you know of, if you can fix it, um, just because a bird flies away. I mean, football players can walk it off, but birds are like tiny football players that don't have helmets. And instead of walking it off under a medically supervised situation, um, they're back up against cats and dogs and raccoons and foxes, and that's really not optimal for anyone. So even if it flies away, it's it's not the end of the story. Yeah, it's uh, I, I know at my parents' house here uh, in uh, my hometown that they've had like issues with bird strikes at their house where um, you know. They, my dad's got a lot of feeders out here. Birds will definitely come and strike the house and they've got a cat. And if that cat is able to get to that bird before it's able to recover, the, the actual strike on the window might not have killed it, but the, like, the resulting, you know, after effects could be the thing that took it out. So, so this is a, an odd topic that usually comes up really late in conversation because, um, you know, aftercare for a bird that's hit a window and is still alive um, the best thing to do is get it to a rehabber immediately because they can give it steroids to help with some of that brain swelling. Um, with cats, it's a huge, huge controversy because, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't get too far into it because then right. death does happen. But um, in terms of fixing windows, um, birds and cats are, or birds and cats, cats and windows are pretty much the number one and number two ways that birds die of you know, preventable deaths, essentially. Um, but if we fixed all of our windows, I strongly suspect that the cat-caused mortality rates would go down because of the reason that 
you're discussing because right. it's a lot easier to catch a bird that's already down. So, yeah. Exactly. So how often does like a bird strike result in a death or are they, or are they able to recover pretty quickly and fly off of where that wouldn't be an issue, say, with a cat at all or so, other predators that are around? Yeah, there's we're really lacking a lot of information on this stuff because ethically, if you find a bird that's down and you can help it, um, you know, we're, we're not going to sit there and wait for it to fly off in most cases. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe there have been some studies done about recovery times. I know Cleveland has had really good luck rehabbing things that have hit their windows. Um, some of those birds only need to be kept in captivity for a day, you know, just protected, medicated, um, you know, quiet time, basically. Um, so like if you are at home and a bird hits a window, if it's still alive, um, put it in a quiet, dark box, keep it safe and warm again. Well, not too warm, but like quiet and safe. Ultimately that's, that's the goal. And after an hour or two, if you can't get it to a rehabber, um, if you open the box and it's fussing around, take it as far away from windows as possible and release it. Um, at least that's standard practice. I'm, <laughs> There's a disclaimer here. I'm not a veterinarian. I can't like, I'm not a rehabber at this point in my life, so I can't legally authorize that, but that's general protocol. Um, but in terms of survival rates, there's actually some work being done on that right now. And we don't have numbers on that yet, but essentially half of the birds that hit windows will die on impact or but as a result of the impact. Um, a lot of birds that do hit die pretty slow, painful deaths and, only 2% of the time is it a broken neck. So that's, you know, everyone's like, oh, it hit a window, it died of a broken neck. No, no, it's usually like internal hemorrhaging. So that's, yeah, if nothing else, we should be fixing our windows to prevent birds from having really painful deaths. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Cause like, I always assume like, just like you said there, that it's, you know, something of, you know, the broken neck variety of where it's immediate death, but Maybe it's just because you, you don't necessarily have a bird that can communicate with you. Hey, I'm in pain. It's, you know, not necessarily my neck, but it's other things that are hurting and stuff. You don't realize what else it is that could be that have killed yeah. it. So the survey that was done on that looked at, I think, about 300 birds that had hit windows. And only, I think, in 2% of the cases was it actually neck related. Okay. Wow. That's, that's definitely very interesting. So since there is so much mortality associated with just the strike on the window itself, what things can people actually do to help prevent, you know, a, a bird strike in the first place? Cause that seems to be, you know, the thing, cause you can't necessarily toughen up the birds against the window. So I guess you have got to do the, you know, on the window end of things to fix the issue. So what things can you do? So this is one of my favorite questions because um, depending on, I mean, obviously, first floor windows are the easiest to fix. Um, buildings that are taller than 60 feet generally aren't residential in most cases. Um, but the first 40 to 60 feet of a building is what really should be addressed on average. Um, so I mean, anything from literally dots of lipstick as a temporary fix, granted, those will smear. You'll have a hard time cleaning those off. Um, but basically, you can space those dots every two to three inches and just do a whole polka dotted smear of them. Um, again, super temporary fix. Um, if you're not into smearing lipstick on your windows, you can take a bar of soap, get it wet and use it like sidewalk chalk on your windows and draw ideally a grid that's either two or three inch spacing. Um, two inches is what would be ideal because even that will prevent hummingbirds from hitting. Larger than two inches may not actually prevent hummingbirds from striking, which is terrible because there are number one species that we pick up. Um, and that holds true for me so far in Illinois, Michigan. And um, I only work with low rise buildings though. So take that with a grain of salt, um, like urban areas, Cleveland, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, they don't get nearly as many hummingbirds as we do. Is it just uh, because the, the hummingbirds aren't necessarily like living in that environment right there and they're more that residential area? Um, also, they're not really nocturnal migrants in terms of mass numbers coming across the lake in the middle of the night. Um, they're more daytime buzzing around feeding, smacking into glass at that point. Um, so it's, it's a weird combination. We've got um, residential fixes 
can be everything from, a, there's a product called Kaleidoscape, which um, basically if you put a screen on your window, that should fix the problem. Um, Kaleidoscape is essentially a window film that acts like a screen. It cuts out a bunch of the UV. Looking out of it, it's still a little bit fuzzy like a screen, but it doesn't really obstruct your view. Um, there's also a product called Feather Friendly that has little dots. Uh, basically every two inches, you can apply it like a tape. Um, there's ABC Bird Tape, which is fantastic. You just need to follow the directions for it to be effective. Um, Acopian Bird Savers are like black paracord strings that you hang every four inches vertically. You can do the DIY thing and um, make your own, but um, they're super, super affordable and pretty easy to install. And again, visually they're, they're not very problematic, but um, yeah, residences and buildings, buildings in this case being taller than five floors, um, there are a couple different problems with the way even humans perceive strikes because um, a lot of people consider the lights out solution to be like the big solution to preventing window collisions. But you can have a three to five story building that has its life lights off at night and have you know, hundreds of birds a year dying just because they're hitting during the day. Um, so it's unfortunately not, <laughs> there's not a single magic bullet solution for, for window strikes. Um, but for people who can tangibly, physically do something in their own yards, you can move your feeders to three feet or directly on your windows um, because that will slow birds down enough to prevent them from injuring themselves too much when they hit. They will hit. Um, basically any yard that has feeders will have bird strikes. So taking either window films or the Ecopian bird savers and moving the feeders really close would be a fantastic combination. Um, there is a bit of misinterpretation when it comes to the study that found that. Um, and basically it said either closer than three feet or further than 30 feet. Uh, the problem is the study ended at 30 feet because that was the, <laughs> the extent of the room that they had to do this study. So um, obviously if you're going from 20 feet to 30 feet running towards a window, 40 feet isn't going to make that much of a difference. Uh, but three feet obviously will. Interesting. Yeah, that's, it's one of the things I've, you know, I've always thought about with, you know, the placement of, so, you know, feeders and things that, you know, say, you know, for example, just to use the example of my parents' yard, since they have so many feeders out in their yard, they've got them all different places. They've got, you know, some that are like right next to the window and then some that are midway out to the yard. So I say maybe about 15, 20 feet away from their main windows. And then they've got some that are that more 40, 50 feet away. And it's just, it'd be interesting if there was some way that you could mark those birds, which ones are visiting which feeders and which ones result in the bird strikes on their windows here. Cause they've got a whole bank of windows, you know, on their backyard. It, it's just, it seems like whenever I'm hanging out here, it's, mm -hmm. there's, it's very common to hear a bird strike happening. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I feel your pain. Uh, my mom has one Hawk sticker on her sliding glass doors <laughs> and it drives me nuts because, um, Hawk stickers do not work at all. They have to be on the outside of the window and spaced super densely. So like the blinds behind me, mm -hmm. um, if those were hanging in front of the windows, they'd be perfect. Um, if, I mean, technically, uh, David Sibley actually did a highlighter test. He took a highlighter, drew a grid on his windows and found that um, basically for two weeks, just that amount of UV was enough to prevent strikes. But of course, that fades after two weeks. So unless you're going out every two weeks to redraw your highlighter stripes, um, you know, window films and tapes are really the best course of action. So the I just threw up a, a graphic here of uh, a building that's got all of these amazing decals of these birds up on their you know building here. It is just like that's not going to do it, is what you're saying. Oh. No, not at all. <laughs> no. Okay, so let's let's play pretend. You're driving along in traffic. Um, there's highway construction, but there's only one cone in the middle of the road. You assume that it fell off the back of a service truck, so you drive around it. Congratulations, you're dead now. Um, okay, same scenario. There's highway construction. There are three or four cones, but they're still spaced so that you can drive between them because you don't see an obstacle. I mean, you still see 
that there's the road continues it doesn't look like the bridge is out so you weave your way between a couple of the cones and you still die now for effective road marking you have to have a lot of cones spaced so tightly that you can't get your car between them or you don't want to get your car between them and that is basically what we have to signal to birds um, if you're actually in the process of either retrofitting windows or perhaps dealing with new construction um, Solix is a brand that makes this fantastic stuff. Um, it's an external window film, cuts back on UV, has very, very fine either horizontal or vertical lines. Um, and I think it's the Intel campus in California completely redid their buildings with Solix film. And it's, it's not super high contrast. Um, but by the time the birds are close enough to see it, it's enough time for them to slow down and redirect. So it doesn't have to be visually <laughs> hideous. Um, like Kaleidoscape is a, is a pretty blunt looking barrier. It's just kind of flat matte white, which you can get customized prints. Um, but I think at one to three dollars per square foot, depending on what option you go for, um, you know, it, visually, Obviously, the, the fancier the product, the higher the cost is. Um, but if people design it into the actual building, um, it's not nearly as <laughs> prohibitive um, when you, you know, compare it to going back and retrofitting an entire building in hindsight. Yeah, so you said something about it being visually appealing, and I could see that being a big concern when it comes to folks. Like, I think of, like, you know, how do I talk my parents into putting something up on their windows that could prevent all of those bird strikes, but still be something that they're going to enjoy, that they can still see out their windows to be able to see all the wildlife that goes back and forth through their uh, area there. And then, you know, that they aren't feeling like, okay, we just made our house look really ugly. Like what kind of things, you know, can you do to either like, you know, what products are there that like are visually appealing, but then other ways, like how can you kind of try to help talk people into doing yeah. something that's good for birds? And also not anger the homeowners association in the process. Exactly. Yes. Um, yeah. So a copian bird savers because they're just little tiny strings. Um, essentially, they're super removable if need be. Um, visually, a lot of people say that their relatives don't even notice that they're there for a few days. Um, so that's that's really low impact. Um, Honestly, Solix window films, I believe you can order their bird safe stuff on Amazon even. Um, but when people are struggling with the cost, you know, honestly, so if your parents' place is killing a minimum of 10 a year, which sounds pretty likely in this case, um, it's, I'm sorry, this computer is. No, <laughs> you're good. You're good. <laughs> um, basically, if, if you can quantify the, hey, your feeders have been up for 10 years and at 10 birds a year, that's 100 birds. Like, which 100 of these birds are you trying to kill? Because, you know, you're effectively doing that with negligence. And it is also a challenge because, you know, once you know better, you can do better. But most people don't know better. Um, like the UV window clings that are, are leaf shaped, the window alert ones. Um, I want to say those came out around 2003, 2004, somewhere in there. Everyone was super optimistic because it's UV and birds can see UV. Again, it's a spacing issue and not all birds perceive UV in the same way. So you can have the brightest beacon of UV and birds will just fly around it. And <laughs> in Illinois, I managed to convince uh, the school to do something about the windows and they were like, okay, we'll do the leaf clings because they're temporary. They're not super sticky. They're just static clings. Um, and sure enough, they put like half a dozen per plate glass window. So, you know, you've got two leaves and then a dove print right in the middle. Like it's, it's just not effective. Um, and also the shapes I find personally are very distracting. So um, you can have the hummingbird stickers, the flower stickers, and eventually cover your entire window with these. And it really cuts into your enjoyment and appreciation of things. And for the same cost, you could have just done the paracord strings or the feather friendly dots. Um, but really it's, you know, it comes down to what your conscience can and can't handle. Um, 
you know, we can, we can also only do so much when it comes to our neighbors, friends, and relatives, but, you know, at least getting the word out there and you know, literally telling everyone, you know, <laughs> at least that's my approach. Um, yeah, sometimes people take it to heart and sometimes people spread it like wildfire. So yeah, you're, you're saying about getting the word out. So one of our uh, viewers right now was asking about if there's any good PSAs out there for people to see to kind of like help explain what it's like for them, you know, say going around those road cones and things like that. So what things can they like so go I see don't online know. or like where can they get <laughs> information? So. Yeah, yeah. So I, I came prepared. Um, I don't know if this is even showing up in the correct direction. Does that? It does looks that good. It looks good. Yeah. Okay. Well, the American Bird Conservancy. Um, if you go to collisions.abcbirds.org. I actually have it up here. Yes. Way to go. Um, <laughs> I love it when it works out perfectly like that. So, yeah, so I'm throwing up the website here for everyone. It's got the, uh, the collisions um, at abcbirds.org for everyone. And then here's the, um, the actual uh, website uh, uh, URL for everyone to, if they want to be able to copy that down for them. So. So this is actually their old flyer because I don't have a, a printout of the new one yet. But it has great little examples of things you can do either with tempera paint or soap or like you can just scribble patterns on your windows and um, like here's some squiggly lines that'll stop birds from hitting. Um, yeah, so some of it is a creative challenge and some of it is just literally what will it take? Anything? Okay, we'll, we'll work with it. Um, I don't know if I sent you the presentations um, that I have been drafting, but uh, a couple of the slides list like the DIY projects. You can hang CDs on the outside of the window, very closely spaced. It's really obnoxious, but it works. Um, the, oh, the other thing, these prevent um, like flying towards reflections of habitat collisions, not territorial strikes. Um, territorial strikes will happen at windows uh, that have any sort of exposed reflective surface. So that's your cardinal sitting there pecking at himself because he doesn't realize that that's not some sexy intruder in his territory. Um, sometimes a rubber snake at that windowsill will do the trick. You might need a couple rubber snakes at every single windowsill that he's near. But, um, you know, put a plastic bag over your side mirror on the car. Just... just Get, get him out doing cardinal things and feeding babies because, you know, we're, we're keeping him from doing important bird things if we allow that behavior to continue. Yeah, I remember, I think it was back in high school or something, that my, you could hear it on the window out by my parents' garage. There was this cardinal that would just constantly be there day after day pecking. And we, we tried to, like, figure out ways that we could get it across, but I like that snake idea. That's something that would be really easy to put up there. I mean, going and getting a rubber snake is, you know, a dollar solution from a dollar store that you can put up. And soaping the window is another good way. I mean, you lose your view out. Um, but if you just do that for a week for each of your windows, it, it should hopefully be long enough that he's like avoiding everything, hopefully, maybe. Um, otherwise, I do know some people have had success putting an entire sheet of newspaper in the window because like right up against the glass, it breaks up the reflection, but again, not in all lighting. Right. So it's, it's a tricky <laughs> birds, birds are so complicated. Oh <laughs> yes. I mean, you're dealing with so many different species and everything. What might work for one might not work for another possibly. So uh, yeah, I think my window collision freezer list is almost at a hundred. Uh, but my overall freezer list is like 140. So yeah. yeah. So we, yeah. Had, we had a question come in asking uh, if there's a difference in the uh, temperature changes between, you know, if it goes from warm to cold. And it, it, I, I don't know if they're necessarily asking about bird strikes, but that does make me wonder, is there a difference between the number of bird strikes that happen during the spring, during the winter, you know, during migration? You know, when is it that you're seeing most of these bird strikes happening? You know, and, and is there a difference, too, in those seasons between, you know, residential? Like, so, like, are there more bird strikes, you know, residential areas during migration versus maybe what there might be in large cities, you know, during migration. So yeah, I just threw that all at you and have fun answering that one. So. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's break this down yeah. into residential collisions. Um, as long as there are birds in or near the yard, whatever factors impact the number of birds there, 
there will be a basically direct correlation between the number of birds there and the number of birds hitting windows. It may or may not correlate to the number of dead birds, um, because if hawks are moving through, you might have lower numbers of birds at your feeders, but when the hawks do come through, they'll panic flight super fast and smash really hard into the glass. Um, so it doesn't necessarily matter time of year. It just depends if the yeah. other species are there. So. Correct. Um, and disclaimer here, yards and feeders aren't really my area of expertise. I can broadly address it, but my specialty is the non-residential low rises that have been pretty unloved until the last couple of years. Uh, Stephen Hager has done some really impressive work on basically university campuses and looking at how many things hit when and where and how. Um, so to address large cities, um, Chicago, New York, Toronto, Ottawa, um, Baltimore, like these groups have, <laughs> it's amazing how they actually get volunteers awake at like five in the morning. Um, which mad props to them. I could never do that. Um, but they basically travel the, the same routes in spring and fall. Um, and spring numbers are, I want to say they're half, maybe a third of what fall collisions are. And what's really kind of a gut punch about that is it's a direct correlation to the number of birds that exist. So, um, I mean, you might have a really light spring or a really light fall because migration conditions were such that they were able to get super high and just haul, you know, in the name of migration. Um, but any of your spring migrants, these are birds who made it through their winter, they made it through their fall migration, they're however old they are, these are the birds that should be breeding and they're heading back to their breeding territories when they die. So it's it's an immediate, like, this bird should have been making babies in a couple of months or weeks, depending. Um, and in fall, you have all these birds who have just hatched. You've got the adults that are heading south, and then this mass of babies that don't even stand a chance because they just hit a window. Um, I think I'm an anomaly here because I've been monitoring some of my buildings year-round. And uh, for low-rise buildings, either campuses or office parks, uh, what we're finding is that summer, granted the definitions of seasons kind of blend it, uh, but basically summer is as bad, if not slightly worse than spring, depending on your habitat. Um, I, I base this very loosely on two college campuses, one in Southern Illinois and one here in Michigan. Um, it's... It's really disconcerting because, you know, in summer you are getting these breeders. Um, so if you blow on their belly and you find a brood patch, you're like, okay, who's, whose mom just died? So, yeah, yeah, you don't know if there's a nest that's going to starve now because, you know, this bird didn't get back to it. Right. So those are the ones that hurt the most. Okay, interesting. So do you see a difference between, say, like a rainy day versus a sunny day with bird strikes? It's, I mean, is there less reflection from one day or another? Or maybe is it just also it could possibly be maybe the birds aren't, you know, as active during those time periods? Um, a lot of, I, I should throw in a disclaimer there. For low rises, I haven't noticed too much of a difference. Um, I do try not to survey on super rainy days. Uh, just because looking for a rock-colored bird on rock-colored rocks or rock-colored birds on bird-colored rocks is challenging when it's dry and when it's wet, it's just abysmal. Um, that being said, though, in large urban areas, um, sometimes there has been a correlation between super foggy weather that... Um, so this is where the light thing comes in. When the fog illuminates and just force forces the entire area into a bright glow that draws more of the migrating birds down. So they then either smash into lights or buildings or windows or any combination of somehow they end up on the ground, which obviously throws them off and puts them at a much higher risk of being either predated, um, scavenged. Like it's, it's a very bad spot for them to be. And even if the weather was perfect, they're now on the ground in an urban maze. So it's, 
it's not always weather dependent. Um, some of it is just peak migration. So mid to late September, you know, it doesn't matter what the weather is, it's going to be terrible. Um, but yeah, sometimes we get an earlier push and some of that can be cold front related. Some of it's not. Um, but honestly, we can't control the weather. The only thing we can do is keep checking all of the buildings all the time. All right. Um, so we had a, another question come in from uh, one of our viewers asking about, does anyone use sound to try to help prevent uh, bird strikes? Has that been something and that folks have tried and doesn't work, it doesn't work at all? <laughs> doesn't okay. work. So, um, my, so I'm in southeastern Michigan, and uh, we had a nice chat with the people who run the building that is doing the most damage in my area. Um, basically, you know, with good intentions, they were like, we are going to get a bird deterrent sound system. And I was like, okay, you realize that's like putting a radio at an intersection that has no traffic signals, right? And they were like, 200 bucks, we got this. I was like, okay. So, um, it every 10 minutes cycled through screaming red tail, distressed crow, um, and a couple other really terrible sounding things. Um, strikes did not go down at all. But again, that's migrating birds aren't next to the building on a 10 minute cycle. Um, that's, yeah, that's like playing bad music at an intersection that's busy and like, it's not going to prevent accidents if, the cars aren't aware that there's a radio like it, it's it's a total yeah it'll really piss off the local birds though uh for the first two days the local red tails were just flying over circling and circling and circling and the jays were mobbing the building but after a week like i don't i don't know what that did to the the local birds so honestly no just just don't unless it's like a grackle roosting problem which again um there are other ways to to solve that but yeah, don't, don't do the nice thing. Just save your money. <laughs> doesn't work. Have, no. Has anyone tried anything else? Like, you know, say like maybe a drone or I mean, since drones seem to be the solution to all of science problems right now, you know, if that's what everyone's trying to like figure out ways to use it for things. Has anyone tried using drones, especially on high rises to try to prevent bird strikes? Not that I'm aware of. Um, also, most of the urban areas are within the, the radius of an airport's no-fly zone, so I feel like that would be pretty challenging. Um, I have heard the suggestion of UV lasers shining at the windows, but again, are you going to do this for every building? Like, yeah. Um, there are a lot of things that have been tried, not terribly many, uh, other than what ABC currently lists have been super effective. Um, like even since 2000, when was that? 2004, 2005, maybe, uh, when we did the first North American birds and buildings conference in Chicago. Um, oh God, that was, <laughs> I was an undergrad and I got Dr. Clem's autograph. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say like, I haven't fangirled over people that I've met at conferences before. I mean, it's only happened, you know, a few <laughs> gazillion <laughs> times. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, Dan Clem is like the, the father of American window collision research. He's been doing this since the 70s. And um, you know, back then, it was also kind of assumed that if you have a boldly patterned curtain and you leave the curtains closed all day and the curtains up close to the window, that should be enough to prevent a bird from hitting because it might overpower the reflection. During some times of the day in certain light, yes, but that's not even like suggested anymore. Um, Back then, it was assumed that if you angled a window down so it reflected the ground instead of the sky, um, that would help. And there are some really beautiful examples of where that was done, and it didn't help at all because they put the building on stilts in a marsh. Oh. So a lot of context is, yeah, yeah. So you can take a, a glass box that's completely mirrors and drop it in the middle of downtown anywhere, like the Apple store doesn't even need to be mirrored. It can be clear. Um, you can do that and still kill a lot of birds, but if you take it and plop it in the middle of a forest, obviously it's going to be much worse. Um, yeah. So you're, you're speaking of some of the researchers that are out there researching bird strikes. Like, mm -hmm. How many of you are there out there? Like, is this something that's pretty well researched or is this something that like we need more scientists to jump in on this and you know, yeah. figure out 
ways, you know, to prevent it, you know, how much this truly is impacting because getting like those, those numbers that you really can share with everyone and say, this is a huge problem here. We've got the, you know, yeah. the full data set to be able to showcase this to the public. Is, is there more need for that from science to like help back up the work that you and others are doing? So what's really incredibly frustrating for me is you know, Dr. Clem has been looking into this since the 70s. Windows have only been getting bigger, shinier, and more structurally um, important since then. Um, you know, architects are moving more and more towards complete glass facades. And so, like, the University of Michigan has a brand new biology building, and it has a couple chunks that are sort of bird safe. Um, but most of it isn't. And what their goal is in hindsight um, is to get their own data from their own building so they can work on their own solutions. Like guys, we had a whole set of pretty decent solutions 10 years ago. Um, Minnesota is doing a fantastic job of actually implementing solutions, but they're taking an art approach to it. Um, so it's, it's frustrating. Also Cornell, um, I don't want to get on too much of a soapbox rant here, but Cornell has the Lab of Ornithology, and I saw it in 2003 and was horrified <laughs> by the amount of glass there. And I was just like, okay, what are they going to do about it? Like, this doesn't look like it's going to prevent collisions. And lo and behold, I think it's only been in the last four years that they started actually surveying. And granted, this is all secondhand. I'm not from Cornell, I didn't go there. I, I don't have anyone on the inside as it were. Um, but you know, this is, this is the lab of ornithology. They are the ones that people go to for advice and preventing collisions and they can preach it, but they can't follow it. And I want to say it was this spring. They finally did a, um, like window collisions seminar type thing. And it was because one of their, you know, webcam red tailed hawks hit a window. Um, like, this year that I know of, peregrines in Berkeley, Kalamazoo, and New York have died hitting windows. That's just like the superstar celebrity birds that have hit. Like, think of all the ones that we don't know about that are hitting. So for Cornell to say, yeah, we're just going to keep picking up bodies at our own building while not doing anything, sets a really bad example. Um, that being said, nature centers should be at the front of this, but there are so many nature centers that you go to and there's like, a hawk sticker and nothing else. So, I mean, part of it is educating the educators. But when I give talks at Audubon places, they're like, oh, we've got this. We're all over this. We know that birds hit windows. We put up our hawk sticker. Things still hit, but I feel better about it. So I think it's really dangerous that we get complacent saying I've done this one thing and eh, it's maybe not terribly effective or maybe it is. It could just be confirmation bias because I don't think I'm hearing as many because, you know, I did something. Um, but like, why would they go through all of the effort to do something else? Um, so it's, it's frustrating because, you know, if we can't convince scientists to take this seriously, how are we going to expect the rest of the public to take it seriously? Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely a, a good point. And, uh, you made reference to Minnesota, which made me think of all the issues with the new football stadium they have up there for the Minnesota Vikings. I remember seeing in the news was such a big controversial thing with all the bird strikes that were going to be happening there. And I have to admit, I didn't see anything past the story. So is yeah. there still an issue with the stadium? You know, have they tried they, to mitigate they, that at all? Or is it still just basically yeah. a bird death trap, you know, for birds going through there? I mean, as much as I love football and everything, I also want my, you know, sports loves to be safe for, you know, animals, you know, such as you know, all the like releasing of b balloons that happen, you know, at football games and things like that. So <laughs> I mean, we all know that that's bad and, you know, trying to get that. But yeah, but something like you said, with these big glass facades are becoming very big with stadiums. And I'm, I know Minnesota isn't going to be the only, only stadium that's, you know, being built in the next, you know, 10, 20 years, it's going to be so much glass. So can you tell us a little bit more about Minnesota, if you know about it, and if they actually have done anything? And is, is there any research being done as to the impacts that are happening at that stadium and other stadiums as well? So what I do know is that uh, they went for a much, much, much larger screen and comfier chairs rather than drop an extra $3 million on changing their glass. 
and they still came out way over budget, which like if you're going to go over budget for saving birds or cushier seats, I, I mean, I'm biased. I also don't really like screens. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's like I, I feel like with me, it's like I, I'm a I'm a big huge sports fan. Like if I wasn't a biologist, I'd probably be a coach, you know, for yeah. athletics. So I mean, I love my yeah. sports, and so I, I love all the the big cushy screen or the big cushy seats and the screens. But I also love my birds too. So it's like I like to see them be able to cover both things. <laughs> I, I would I would love honestly to see a bunch of the bird mascots just you know go lay down in front of the stadium just to to get that out there because honestly. Um, Ever since the design was first proposed, um, I want to say it was Twin Cities Audubon. Um, yeah, they were immediately on top of it because, you know, from a, a collisions perspective, once you've picked up dead birds at a dozen different buildings, you start to get an idea of what a bad building looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing that both in size and reflectivity, it was incredibly alarming. And they can't say they didn't know. Um, they were approached repeatedly by the local Ottoman folks and the, <laughs> the end result so far has been, we will study this. So I believe they are funding three years worth of collision monitoring there. I believe it's only during fall. It might also be during spring. Um, but basically this is part of why the citizen science aspect of collisions is really iffy because I love public information, but with something like the stadium, if you pick up 65, I think it was 65, it was a number of birds. If we, if we round it to an even hundred and say, okay, we picked up a hundred birds at the stadium all fall, people who don't think that the stadium is obligated to do anything will say, oh, it's only a hundred birds. You know, what, what kind of drop in the bucket is that? I mean, it's not a huge drop in the bucket, but when you realize that the odds of you finding a hundred percent of the birds is entirely tiny. Um, I mean, most places, if you're lucky, you'll have about a 30% detection rate. Um, scavenging is incredibly problematic. Um, Well-intended people picking them up and throwing them away or putting them under bushes or, you know, there, there are so many things that affect whether or not you can even find these birds. Um, you know, what you're finding is the tip of the iceberg. So, yeah, because you could easily have them like stuck up in a tree somewhere and you never even have it fall. So where you get to it or yeah. Or it hit and it flew away and just wasn't mm -hmm. stunned enough to stay close. Um, so looking at a problem of that magnitude, like, okay, after three years, are you even going to do anything? Um, you say you're working with 3M. Well, that's cool. But how much is it going to cost you to do the retrofit now rather than when it was under construction? So Honestly, preventative measures would have been fantastic, and they missed their chance on that by a long shot. So, um, yeah, it's it hurts our hearts, especially because legislation, I believe it was statewide in Minnesota, was passed like two months after that. It was it was in the works when it was being built, but like, oh, they finished construction two months before legally they had to factor bird safety into their designs and construction. Yeah. Talk, yeah. You know, talking about, you know, big news items when it comes to bird strikes and, you know, trying to uh, prevent things. I remember uh, this past uh, September with the nine 11 lights that were shining in New York to commemorate, you know, that horrible day mm -hmm. that they turned off the lights. And I, I think probably a lot of people were, really confused as to what was going on with that. And it was all because from my understanding it was the migrating birds that were going through. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and you know, yeah. why that was necessary to turn off the lights? So an oversimplification would be that birds are really big moths. Lights impact them in ways that we don't quite fully understand. Um, and when you have beams of light pointing straight up that are on all night, you basically end up with birds draining their fat reserves by circling and circling and circling. Um, the 9-11 memorial, again, it's a design that was proposed. People were like, hey, guys, this is a bad idea. It's like a balloon release when somebody dies or sky lanterns. There's so many things that you can do that 
can be thoughtful ways to commemorate these situations uh, that don't negatively impact creatures. Um, I'm not sure about this year, but in previous years, you know, the lights will be on for an hour at a time and then off for 10 to 15 minutes to let the birds disperse and then they'd be back on for another hour. That's still an hour of a lot of birds circling, trapped basically in the beams of light. Um, I mean, a similar comparison would be this spring, there was a building in Galveston, Texas that killed about 300 birds, almost 400 maybe. Um, it was a bunch in one night. And while that is, at least for that location, an exception rather than the norm, you know, on an average night, those 300 birds would be scattered hitting a bunch of other things. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily see them in that volume. But the 9-11 thing, because it has such publicity and so many strong opinions in all directions. Um, I mean, it's also very visible. People who are on site look up and say, wow, I can see all these tiny specks that are just swarming. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, eh, you know, if it's a light in your yard, it's, it's just some bugs at a light. But when you realize that these birds are trying to conserve as much energy as possible to get to Central and South America, you know, it, it changes the scale a bit. So, I mean, I would love to see those lights on for 10 minutes, off for 15, you know, and keep that kind of pattern as, as a compromise. Um, who knows? We'll, we'll see. I, I think New York Audubon has made some really good progress working with the folks at the 9-11 Memorial to at least cut down on, on some of that. Yeah. Is there issues with, you know, say like having those lights on at night? You know, a lot of us don't think of birds flying at night. We always mostly assume most of them are just roosting. But obviously mm -hmm. you do have these birds flying through these big cities at night. Are like how many bird strikes are happening at night with some of these species because you have that light reflecting st still on those windows or maybe just straight hitting them? You know, are they able to avoid those buildings even if there is no light? Like, you know, are they able to detect those buildings are there? Are they just flat out like flying into something that happens to be 300, 400, 1,000 feet up in the air just because it's there and they don't see it at all? So, um... I think the best study that addresses that is either McCormick Place in Chicago or the Post Tower in Bonn, Germany. Um, each of those buildings went from being basically brightly fully lit at night during migration to completely dark um, or as close to completely as you know, safety codes will allow. And even though McCormick Place is a long, narrow building that's very low, it was still getting, I want to say... 3,000-ish average. These are numbers off the top of my head that might be for a season. Um, but the post tower was killing about a thousand birds during the season. And each of those locations, just by completely turning their lights off, you know, saved 50% on their energy bill. But also they managed to cut their mortality by about 80%. So things will still hit, but it'll be a lot fewer. Nice. Yeah, because I know that they're uh, say with uh, um, FCC towers, you know, the you know, communication towers and uh, wind turbines, there's also issues with birds hitting those and they're trying to figure out ways that they can mitigate it, you know, such as, you know, switching yeah. maybe the type of light bulb that they use, you know, uh, I, I can't remember which way it goes. I should remember because I've seen the study presented enough times, but I can't remember if they're going from, I think it's the blinking light to the steady light, you know, yeah. to be able to prevent it. Yeah. I think that's the way it's going. If I'm wrong, Joelle Gary tweet me in, like, you know, correct me on that, because I know she's the one doing all the studies uh, with yeah. it. Um, yeah. But it's like, you know, sometimes just those simple changes can help prevent those. Is there... And you know, thanks to that law is in place. So as lights burn out, they're being replaced with the safer ones. But yeah, um, red lights are terrible. They actually screw up a bird's magnetic navigational orientation. Um, white lights are, you know, bad enough, but... Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, but, you know, not all of us, you know, have those abilities to, like, go through and make, like, these massive changes to our homes or maybe, say, like, you know, the buildings that we work in. So what's, like, if you could only do one thing and, like, the cheapest thing, what's what's the thing that you would tell, you know, the viewers out there, like, you can do this and you can afford to do this kind of thing? Like, I, I always think with, um, you know, um, say, like, with my parents at their home, you know, always trying to figure out ways I can make them more green, but ways that they can afford it. You know, it came down to like, 
we could put a rain barrel there for you to collect it and be able to water your flowers and save you know, water that way and you know be more conservative. But like putting up a wind turbine or solar panels was going to be way too expensive for them well, to do, or the laws weren't you know situated here that they could do that too. So like, yeah. what's what's yeah. the simple things out there that people can do that at least would be you know help a little. Uh, honest, honestly, I, I feel like the Grinch who stole green energy because I spent three years on a wind farm in the middle of nowhere. And basically, I just cut my carbon footprint as much as I possibly can because I can't, with a clean conscience, support any industrial scale wind because, you know, I was in the boonies. There was nothing ecologically interesting or migrationally exciting about Abilene, Texas. And um, that kept me up at night for a very long time. Um, especially when you figure that what we were finding again was the tip of the iceberg. Right. But if you can't do solar panels on your roof or like small scale wind in urban areas where things that might die are going to be theoretically starlings or pigeons, um, you know, if, if we can't, you know, just turn off your TV, uh, <laughs> un actually unplug it from the wall because um, I know the, the term energy vampire was uh, trendy a couple of years ago, but that's still a thing that hasn't gone away. The more technology that we have that's you know, green, the more technology we amass. So, um, you know, give your relatives who have cats a ton of catnip in the spirit of keeping the cats inside and busy. Um, you know, cat bibs are really strange looking and, you know, not... Bells don't work, but cat bibs can at least theoretically cut cats hunting by like 60%, depending on the size of the cat bib. Um, you know, I don't want to endorse outside cats, but if Fluffy is going to be outside for the rest of its life, just swear that you will never let Fluffy 2.0 outside, you know, and, and just work on helping people understand that, you know, we can't save the world, but we can actually do a few things in that direction. Um, if you, for example, rent and your windows are super clear, or if you're a couple stories up and you can't get to your outside windows, post-it notes. Make a checkerboard of post-it notes. How you know, Are you actually looking out the window all the time? That post-it note checker pattern might not work in all light, but it should, in some light, at least be more effective than nothing. Um, if you can move your feeders closer, do that. Uh, they're just, there are a lot of ways um, also on ABC's website that will give you fantastic ideas, be it, you know, temporary soap stripes, paint stripes, fake frost. Um, you know, if, I want to say it was the November issue of uh, Birders Guide from the American Birding Association. They gave me free reign to do kind of a, a listicle of, you know, these are the expensive options, these are the less expensive options, and these are the super cheap options. Um, I should be able to email you the, the PDF link for that and you can post it. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'll definitely tweet that out for sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm sitting here going, what things, oh, I've already done this. I can cite it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge though, because every building is different. Um, every yard is different. It's never a dull moment for sure. Right. Yeah. I guess, you know, as we're running out of time here, um, the biggest thing with it is maybe just trying to make people aware. Is is that your, your biggest difficulty right now? And maybe something that us says, you know, people who are scientists or love science or in the science communication fields, like we, I think, I guess you're saying we need to do a better job of letting people know yeah. about bird strikes. It's not that awareness is a problem because shoot, I mean, Windex used it in their ads forever. You know, there are cartoons of birds hitting windows. It's a ubiquitous thing. It's so common that we've basically tuned it out. Okay. And we need to find a way to not tune it out that is neither incredibly depressing of here, look at all of my dead birds, um, but also isn't like, oh, it'll be fine. So the the happy medium in there somewhere is where I struggle because, yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, last year I picked up over I mean, almost 200 dead birds. And for me, that wasn't really that many. Because, you know, I was hitting a dozen to 15 buildings, which, you know, per building, it's, it's not that bad. And then you realize, oh, I might have been finding 30%. That's actually pretty bad. Right. <laughs> oh, this building only killed 20 this year. Well, if we extrapolate, that's closer to 60. So, yeah. You know, 
what we what we know from our own detection um, it kind of gets into religious territory because like you can't prove the existence of God well you can't prove the existence of window strikes because sometimes they don't leave a smudge mm-hmm. um, but with enough presence absence surveys and uh, carcass removal and scavenging things you can prove that what you're finding is not the entire story which yeah yeah yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's interesting. Like, I, I never knew until, you know, talking to you today that is, you know, how many um, mm-hmm. bird strikes there actually were. It's like, I mean, when you're talking, it's not just a few thousand here, a thousand there. You're talking into the millions and beyond. It's yeah. it's really and, quite distressing. And a perfect example is um, last month, our local Audubon meeting, like, I show up to every Audubon meeting with a cooler and an ice pack and say, hey guys, I'm here, bring me your birds. Um, (laughs) What I do. But um, one of the the members raised their hand, the meeting's open with bird stories, and she said, we had a hermit thrush hit our window. And the president of our Audubon group was like, Heidi, I think you have something to comment here. And I was like, hi everybody. How many of you know of a bird that hit a window in the last week? So this is a canned audience of about 40 or 50 people who are well aware of birds and half a dozen of them raised their hands. So if you took the population of insert name of city here and extrapolated, that's a lot of people who in the back of their mind were like, oh yeah, a bird hit a window. I feel like in a way I'm kind of the clearinghouse for dead birds in my county because there will be days where my phone will blow up because, oh, there are eight dead birds and I haven't left the house yet. And you know, that's just people telling me about stuff that they're either going to bring me or that I need to pick up from them. So, you know, just knowing that what we're aware of is nowhere near the full story because like we're, I mean, we tune it out. Um, also, you know, if, if birds are hitting in these numbers, why don't we see them everywhere? Well, do you actually look down around the perimeters of these buildings? Is no, there? I, I don't walk around know? my place at all. And, you know, it's just, it's, yeah. yeah. And a lot, a lot of these um, landscapers have also figured out if we plant shrubberies here, people won't complain about the bodies. So there are a lot of things compounding it. Plus squirrels love protein. I can't tell you how many reports I've gotten of squirrels eating hummingbirds or chickadees or warblers. Um, yeah, so, so they're up against raccoons and foxes and it's, <laughs> it's an uphill battle. Right. Yes. No, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's been very eye opening, I think, to talk to you today and hopefully everyone out there in Periscope land, uh, got a lot out of it too. Um, I see we're just about out of time here. So I best, you know, say thank you to, uh, Heidi for uh, coming on and talking to us and, uh, definitely really appreciate it. And, uh, Love to hear you, know, you know, in the future as to what else you're finding and if, you know, you can, you know, new ways to help prevent bird strikes and more, you know, data as you guys are collecting it and getting to know a little bit more of what's going on out there in, you know, the human slash bird interaction world. So, Thanks for having me, Nicole. Yes, it was uh, a definite pleasure. If you've got more questions for Heidi, so if you are uh, didn't get your questions in today or you're watching this on replay, uh, definitely uh, please uh, contact her at uh, Just A Birds on Twitter. Uh, if you'd like to uh, contact uh, me, you can either uh, tweet me at SciCom Monday or um, uh, at my personal handle of Wildlife Biogal. And then uh, next week, we're going to be talking to Ellen George. She's from uh, Cornell University. She's uh, a PhD student there, and she is, uh, works with Cisco out in the Great Lakes, and her handle is, namely enough, Great Lake Cisco. And so she's going to be talking to us all about this uh, amazing uh, fish that's uh, in the Great Lakes. And then we also just want to uh, send a quick shout out to uh, everyone who uh, supports us on Patreon. We really appreciate everyone's support uh, helping to make this broadcast possible. And then a big, huge thank you to Jason Leathers. He's one of our major uh, Patreon sponsors out there, and he goes by uh, I for MSU on uh, Twitter. So a big, big thank you to him. And if you liked the broadcast and want to be able to help uh, continue the broadcast, uh, please go visit our Patreon site. It's uh, uh, 
W wow, that, I said like six gazillion W's in there today. You guys all know what I'm talking about. So www.patreon.com backslash SciComm. And then we're currently right now uh, running a, a special uh, GoFundMe uh, for uh, SciComm money because we know not everyone is uh, extremely comfortable with uh, doing the Patreon since uh, Patreon is a monthly uh, donation where a uh, GoFundMe is just a one-time uh, donation. So please uh, go visit our GoFundMe, which is www.gofundme.com backslash SciComm Monday, uh, fall 2017. So please uh, go visit us there. And then with that, if you are a scientist or a science communicator, communicator please uh, come be on the broadcast. We'd love to be able to talk to all of you. We've had a lot of great people come on the broadcast and we want to keep talking to everyone and hear all these really interesting stories that everyone has out there. And then uh, with that, I just want to say uh, thank you to uh, everyone for tuning in today. Go explore, do some science, have some fun, and we'll see you on the next SciComm Monday.